So because the um, implied forward rate limits out at continuous compounding, we can use that result to express the uh, equation for the forward rate as not so mathematically difficult uh, as uh, writing everything out and solving for r. We can simply just use the variables involved in the description of what we're looking for, uh, the rates and, and the time periods. <clears throat> so only with continuous compounding, by the way, does this hold. Only with continuous compounding. So that the forward rate is the rate in period 2 times t2 minus the rate for period 1 minus t1. So uh, we had our curve last time, or our forward rate. Remember, we knew the two-year, and we knew the three-year, and we were trying to solve for the one-year rate two years out. So what we would do is R2 is uh, down here, R2, R1. This is T2. This is T1. So when? In time period 1. For how long? Up to time period 2. And we just solve. R2, remember, was 0 0.04. T2 is 3 years. Minus R1, remember we said that that was 3%. And how long was that? That was a 2-year rate, times 2. Over, T2 is 3 years out. T1 is 2 years out. So we get 0.12 minus 0 0.06 over 1, which equals 0 0.06 or 6%. So we can just solve it directly that way. So no matter what we're looking for, uh, we, we always know what R2 is. R2 is the longer termed uh, zero. R1 is the shorter termed zero. T2 is the length of time for that, that applies to the R2 rate. T1 is the length of time that applies to the R1 rate. And we're trying to solve for the uh, unknown one year. The question is that I get sometimes is, can you solve for longer periods than one year? Uh, no, not really, because there's no such thing as a two-year interest rate. There's a two-year investment on a, uh, a compounding frequency that is either annual, semi-annual, quarterly, etc. So if you want to ask, can you solve for a rate that's only six months long? Yes, you can. Can you solve for a rate that's three months long? Yes, you can. Can you solve for a rate that's two years long? Not really. Uh, if you're solving for a rate that's two years long, you would solve a one-year, compounded however you want. Once you have that forward rate, you would use the, the zero curves to, to, to find the next forward rate, and you would just use those two in combination. But uh, typically, you're solving a one-period rate at a time. So within here, there may be different compounding periods, but it's one. This this we're implying that this is an annual one-year rate. So. Um, R2, T2, R1, T1 are just automatically given. Once we know one zero rate and once we know the other zero rate, we know R1, R2. And so we can solve it directly. So follow me on what we're going to do here. We're going to rewrite this equation a, a, little, bit, uh, a little bit simpler in the book. It actually does it for you, but it makes a lot of jumps. And you're wondering, well, how did you, how did you get that derivation? Uh, and without knowing how you got from here to the derivation, uh, you're left memorizing. And you can't memorize this stuff. You, you, you can't. You have to know it. So let's do it. Since, <clears throat> and follow along here, since 0 0.04 times 3, remember our first term here, R2, T2, 0, 0.4 times uh, uh, 3, is the same as 0 0.04 plus 0 0.04 times 2. Do you get that? 0 0.04 times 3 is the same thing as saying 0 0.04 plus 0 0.04 times 2. Because 0 0.04 times 3 is 0 0.12, and 0 0.04 times 2 is 0 0.08, plus 0 0.04 equals 0 0.12. <clears throat> In fact, you could say this for anything. You could say uh, 6 times 7 is uh, 42, but also 6 plus 5 times 7 is 42. Notice how you can break one out. You can do that with anything. So this is not a matter of how did you know how to do that. You can always break a number out to make a term that looks like another term. Well, look what we've done in this case. We have a 2 here. And if you look at the second term, there's a 2. So now we've expressed R2, T2 in terms of T1. 
So what we have is we can break out the R2, T2. We can say RF now equals R2 plus, what do we have here? R2, T1. So we've turned T2 into T1 by breaking out one term. That's all we've done. Give it a try with any, any two multiplication numbers. You can always break it out by multiplying, by breaking one number out and subtracting one and multiplying it by and multiplying it out and adding. You can get the same thing. So let's just finish it off here. Uh, minus R1, T1. Everything else stays the same over T2 minus T1. So you're starting to see how we got the first term out, right? Well, look, we have a common term here, T1. So we can rewrite uh, the forward rate as R2 plus R2 minus R1 T1 over T2 minus T1. But R2 plus R2 minus R1 T1 over this denominator is the same as writing R2 plus R2 minus R1 over 1 times T1 over T2 minus T1. In other words, it's the same as saying R2 plus R2 minus R1 over 1, which I'm not going to write in, but if you write it, this is, fraction can be written as over 1, times T1 over T2 minus T1. So this is, uh, this is what we get in the book. We go uh, uh, from uh, the original uh, formula we have up here all the way down to this one. And without the steps in the middle, um, I find that more students uh, feel they have to memorize this all the time. Okay, how was that? How did that work? But if you knew this one, and this one's fairly easy. You don't even have to memorize this. This one's fairly easy to, if you have this curve, you can figure this one out very easily. That if you know the steps to get down here, you never have to memorize the extra formula. You just say, you know what, if I get in trouble, I'll just derive it. It's easy enough. Okay, so, so what? Where are we going with all this? What does this mean? Well, we're going to make two other statements here before we get to the big so what. So let's uh, have a look at what we have here. We have two scenarios. And the sharp student will have already seen that, wait a minute, that results in two different scenarios, right? There's T1, there's T2, here's our second scenario, T1, T2, and we have our rates. Now, we could have a situation where, at time T1, the uh, uh, rate R1 is here, and at time T2, R2 is up here. So we could have an upward sloping curve. In which case, the forward rate, Rf, implies that it's greater than R2. <clears throat> Why? Because look at the formula here. Rf equals R2 plus something. Let's just put big square brackets around the plus something. So Rf will equal R2 plus something. And if R2 is greater than R1, this term will be positive. This term will always be positive, by the way. T1 over T2 minus T1, that will always be positive because you can't have negative time. Uh, I, I know that Einstein says you can, that theoretically you can have negative time in, in the depths of a black hole, but we're not in the depths of a black hole. However, if you were calculating this in the depths of a black hole, you would have to adjust that second part of the formula to maybe have a negative factor, but I think you'd have bigger problems. Anyways, so R2 minus R1, in this case, R2 minus R1 is going to be positive, so the, the forward rate is going to be the R2 rate. In our case, it was 4%. We had 3% as our R1 and 4% here. So we're going to have a positive term times a positive term. So R2 plus something positive, which means RF is going to be greater than R2, mathematically speaking. <clears throat> we don't have to uh, do a lot of thinking for that. And what was RF? RF was 6% in this case. R2 was 4%, so yes, that worked. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. We could have a situation where at T1, R1 is here, but at T2, R2 is down here. We might have a downward sloping curve. Well, in that situation, we can always say, we can come up with uh, um, this conclusion, RF will be less than R2. Why? Because RF equals R2 plus something. So if R2 is less than R1, this term in here will be negative. You'll have a negative 
times a positive, you'll still have a negative inside the green brackets. R2 plus a negative is something less than R2. So RF will be less than R2. So because we know uh, uh, with continuous compounding that this holds, there's a lot of interesting and exciting stuff we can do with that. We can change the, the, the terms and we can come up with some conclusions very quickly. Uh, so if we have a rising curve, we know that our forward rate will be greater than, our, uh, than, than the rate applied to the longer of the two uh, bonds that we're comparing or the two investments that we're comparing. If we have a downward sloping curve, we know that our forward rate will be less than it. Now this is important. This is important. Not so much right now, but when we get to more of the theories of why we have the shape of the curve that we do, why we have the shape of the zero curve, depending on what theory uh, makes more sense, the shape of the curve also tells you something else about, for, about expectations, and the forward rate is implied in that, so you can set up some trading strategies if you think that the curve is not matching the reality of what the world will be at that time. That's what makes a market. Uh, I know I'm jumping ahead and making things sound a little bit more complicated than what it was, but I think it's important that when we do this kind of stuff to at least bring you a few steps in the real world and say, it is, we do apply this. This is real stuff. This is not just uh, 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 mental gymnastics that we do just to show how smart we are. This is stuff we actually apply out there. And as we go through some of the later chapters, you'll see where this is applied. So if you look at this and think, uh, I'm just going to breeze over this quickly, don't. This is a foundation stone for something later on. You got to know this now. Okay. So let's get to our big so what. Well, let's start with the. Um, what we have in the book, we have a certain number of years, we have five years, and we have observations on the spot rate for those five years. From that, we were able to calculate the implied forward rates uh, based on the spot curve. So now we're ready to put this together into a, a potential trade. And, and we're going to do it just from a speculator's point of view, not a hedger. We're just going to do it from a speculator's point of view. Let's say that we borrow $100 at 3% for one year. Let's put a timeline up and here's one year. We're going to borrow $100 for one year at 3%, which means at the end of one year, we got to pay that loan back. Okay. What are we going to do with this $100? We're going to invest this $100, but instead we're going to invest it long. We're going to invest it for two years at 4%. So we're borrowing at three, investing at four. Anybody will tell you that if your times match, if you can borrow for a year at 3% and invest for a year at 4%, do it all day long. The problem is our times don't match. We're borrowing at 3% for one year and we're investing at 4% for two years. The spot rates imply that there is a 5% rate in the second year. So here's the deal. Our $100 will grow at 4% over two years. This $100 uh, loan will go will balloon up to 10305 at the end of one year. So we have to pay back 10305. So the trade makes sense if we can borrow 10305 here for this period of time for less than 5%. Because the forward the spot rates imply that the forward rate is 5%, if it comes in if the real rate comes in less than 5, the loan balance will be less then the investment will grow to. And we make the spread on that. That implies a belief. If you believe you can borrow 103.05 in one year, because we know that that's what our loan will grow to, if we can borrow 103.05 for less than 5%, there we go. We can also go uh, the other way around. We can borrow, and let's... Uh, Let's make our timeline here. We can borrow $100 at 5% for four years. So we're going to borrow $100 for four years. So we're going to have to pay back some amount of money in four years. And we're going to have to pay back 100 uh, e to the RT, R being 5%, T being 4. Well, we can invest that down here for... Uh, uh, for three years. So here's our four-year rate. Here's three. And we'll invest at 4.6%. Now, right off the top, you would say, that doesn't seem right. You're going to borrow at 5 and invest at 4.6. So we're going to invest at 4.6%. Why would we ever do this? Well, 
If we look at the uh, three to four year uh, 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 rates, uh, it implies that the implied forward rate, and this one's a little tricky, so I'll tell you, the implied forward rate, when? In three years. What? A one year. So in three years, a one year rate will equal 6.2%. So the implied forward rate here is 6.2%. So at the end of year three, we would have to invest our money at a minimum of 6.2% just to pay back this loan. So we would do this if we believe that we can invest 11480 because that's what our uh, $100 will grow at, at 4.6 for three years. If we can invest 11480 in three years for more than 6.2% on a one-year investment, because that's the implied forward rate. If we think we can get better than that, then sure, we're willing to borrow uh, uh, longer and invest shorter because we think that the implied forward rate is too low. And uh, so we can use that. Now, look at what's going on here. This is a lot of work. Each one of these is called a leg. We have to put in several legs to get a trade in. Two legs for each trade. Well, whenever we have a trading strategy that involves multiple legs, it doesn't take long before some enterprising uh, financial engineer somewhere says, you know what? I've got a product that solves this whole purpose, that solves this whole thing. And that product is called the forward rate agreement which actually combines the two legs into one thing called a forward rate agreement. Let's have a look at what that is.